like to welcome all of you to this service of worship at the Congregational Church of Brookfield. What? My microphone absolutely is on. You hear me? I can bellow louder. <clears throat> we do want you to know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Um, so, that said, let us um, center our minds and hearts in a time of silent prayer as we listen now to the tolling of our church bell. <laughs> Will you please join me in the call to worship? New life is coming. We can count it in days now. God is breaking through in dreams and visions, in the miracles we see happen. God's word has the power to change the world. We are changed by the great love that comes from the birth of Emmanuel, God with us. The covenant promise has come down through the generations the promise of God's never-ending love. We feel it through the love of family and friends, those who claim us as their own. Today, we light the candle of love. We give thanks for God's steadfast love. So when I and my family were invited to light the Advent candle today, we were asked to identify a tradition or an object that means something to our family. No one resonated the holidays in our family more than my mom, Situ. Uh, Situ left us on Christmas Eve 2012. These, if I can get them out, represent Situ. <laughs> Situ was a card shark. <laughs> and in memory of our Situ, even the day that she passed away on Christmas Eve, we played 500 Rummy that night in her honor. We continue to do that year after year. My mom taught us all how to play rummy before we can barely even hold the cards. But we will do that again this Christmas Eve and probably Christmas Day as well. And the little ones might scatter underneath the table to collect any money that has dropped off the table that we were betting with. But that's our tradition. This is in honor of my mom. Our situ planted a competitive spirit among us. It reminds us of all the Christmases present as we continue the tradition, we play our games together, and we surround everybody in our home with competition and a lot of love. Will you join us in our prayer for the light of love as we light this week's Advent candle? Luca and Lou are gonna light the candles. Join me in the praying for the light of love. As we light the candle of love, Holy One, we look to you for help. We wait for you to fulfill the promises you have made to us as your beloved children. As we gather for worship, O Lord, open our hearts to the life-giving power of your strong and steadfast love. Grant us renewed hope when the world casts us aside or tries to break us down. Help us to use our words and actions to bring about peace and to spread joy in our community and beyond. Bless us with the gift of faith, which only you can inspire as we wait for our coming Messiah. Amen.
And I'd like to invite forward any children who'd like to come and spend a moment with me. And I would get in from. Um, so I have a question for you all this morning. My question is, what do you put on the top of your Christmas tree? A star? An angel? A snowflake. A snowflake? Nice, yeah. What about you, Natalie? Another star. Another star. Yeah, a different star? I was going to say, we put um, a Christmas top hat on the top of our Christmas tree. And so um, it has pictures of penguins and Christmas lights and also, and it lights up and changes colors and all sorts of craziness. Um, but today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about one of the things that you mentioned, I think, ladies, which is this. You have a ton of these? All right, a ton of angels hanging out at Kennerly's house. Yeah. has the same angel in her room. Yeah, so this is one of my angels. Um, I made my own stuff with my own <laughs> angel and the face was me. Oh, you made an angel out of yourself, Vera? That's awesome. So hey, so angels, angels play a pretty important part in the Christmas story, don't they? Um, who do the angels come to talk to in the Christmas story? Who do you think they come to talk to? Who do you think, Kennerly? They do get that. Mira, you're right. Maybe. Who knows? What, what do you think, Kennerly? Did you have a thought? Are we going with Miss Natalie over? Mary. And who else, Natalie? They come to talk to the shepherds. And who else? God. What? Yeah, well, God sends the angels to talk to people, right? And who else do they come to talk to? Joseph, right? Yeah. So there are, um, and the angels come and they talk. <coughs> Excuse me to these people because they have very important jobs for all of them. So um, the first people that the angels come to talk to are Mary and Joseph, right? And they come to tell them that they are going to be the parents of this really special, really important baby that's going to come into the world. Who was that baby? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. And so they come to say that, that they are going to be the parents. Jesus loves you this, you know, that's right. All right, drop the mic, I'm out. Um, <laughs> So they come to tell them that they're going to be the parents of Jesus. And now Mary and Joseph may not have been the most well-known people on the planet. They weren't a king and a queen. They may not have even been particularly well-known outside of their village where they were. But God had a really important job for them. And the angels let them know about that very important job. And when the angels came to Joseph and Mary, did they scream and run away? Ah! No. What did they do? They listened. And what did they? What else did they do? Did they maybe? Whoa. They stayed calm. Yeah, maybe. Gosh, I think so. Maybe, Natalie. What's that? They said okay, right? All right, we're gonna have this baby, and we're gonna do this, right? And so Joseph decided that he was gonna go ahead and be Jesus's dad, and. 265 years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, but yeah, there you go. But yeah, so Mary and Joseph said, you know what? <laughs> we are going to do this, is what they said, and they decided to raise baby Jesus um, and did some really important things. Now, if they had said no, the story would be a little bit different, but they said yes when the angels came to them. And you know who else gets to say yes to a call from God? All of us. Right? Because God asks all of us to be messengers of good news, like those angels were so long ago, and to be messengers of God's love and to share God's love with other people. And so some of the things that I have seen you guys doing already to share God's love throughout Advent, right? I got to deliver an Advent wreath to somebody who can't get out of her house particularly well, and it was because some of our... I was going to say, Allison, I'm looking at you, right? Because some of our church school kids decided that they wanted to make one for somebody who needed one. That is a ginormous wreath up there. The one that I delivered was not quite that large. <laughs> 
Um, and I saw cards go out to people who've lost loved ones or who've been sick throughout this year. Um, and I saw lunches get made for people who wouldn't have food to eat otherwise for the folks at Loaves and Fishes. And so that's the way that you guys are already sharing the good news and God's love with other people out in the world. And our call is not to do that just during the Christmas season, but to do it all year long. So do you think that we might be able to take up that challenge? Do you think you guys can share God's love with other people all year long? Yes. Yeah? Okay, Do you think so for real? Yeah. Yeah? All right. Awesome. So let us pray for just a second. So dear God, we thank you for the stories we read about how you sent angels to Joseph and Mary to share important calls for their lives and for their life together. And we thank you that they said, okay. And we thank you for trusting us with the job of taking the message of Jesus and his love to all the world. Help us to have the strength, the courage, and the love to continue to do that beyond the Christmas season and to share your love all year round. Amen. All right, you guys. Head to church school. All right. be seated. Will you pray with me? God of generations past, of the present, and of generations to come, we pray this morning that your word will not fall on deaf ears, on closed minds, on hardened hearts. May your word shared here today transform us. May we hear through these words a reminder of your promise to be with us and a renewed call to world transforming love in your name. Amen. This morning's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary for your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son. And he named him Jesus. 
May God add a blessing to our understanding of these holy words. Amen. Friends, will you pray with me for a moment? <clears throat> Holy One, help us to be still and to know that you are God and that you are here present among us. Settle in us all that seems unsettled so that we might truly open ourselves up, our minds, our hearts, our lives, to the word that you have for each of us today. Amen. Well, there are multiple versions to every story. I think of the birth story of our firstborn child. The things that stick out in my mind are the fact that when I first started to have contractions, the first thing I did was tell Ryan, and then I immediately went to the kitchen to bake cookies for the nurses at the birthing center. I went through all of my active labor at home, so I distinctly recall watching Groundhog Day on the television while laying on the floor of our little apartment's living room, clutching a pillow and telling Ryan that if this day was going to be repeated over and over and over again, like it was in the movie, that I was definitely going to need drugs instead of doing this thing au naturel. I remember the copious amounts of garbage bags and towels that Ryan put on the passenger seat of our brand new car picked up two days before this all happened, now over 11 years old and running strong, so that it wouldn't be ruined in case the baby decided to come en route to the hospital. I remember saying that it was time to push and the announcement that it was a boy. And I remember Ryan saying that our son, Brayden, had perfect hands and the biggest feet he had ever seen on a baby. <laughs> I remember snuggling Brayden for the first time and all seeming right and frightening and beautiful and overwhelming and blessed all at the same time. <clears throat> now, when you ask Ryan about the birth of our firstborn child, he will tell you that when I told him I was having contractions, the first thing he did was run down to the garage to install the car seat in such a way that he man himself could not extract it and then proceeded to play the waiting game. In his head thinking, well, if Jen and the midwife seem to say that this thing is happening in a normal way, then we're gonna go with that. As he watched me curled up in the fetal position on our living room floor. When the word came that it was time to go to the hospital, he remembers driving as quickly as possible, walking into the birthing center, setting up to push, and being there reminding me to breathe and offering me Gatorade as needed, <laughs> and experiencing the weirdness and the realness of it all as an onlooker. It was not the things of the movies anymore. And then the flood of emotion, the pride and fear and excitement as they announced that it was a boy and laid him in our arms. Now I share these perspectives with you because we get two very different birth stories of Jesus in our scriptures. There's the one in Luke, the one that has come in, to, in popular culture to be known as the Linus story from the Peanuts, the one where the angel Gabriel announces Jesus' birth to Mary, where she proceeds to go to see Elizabeth, and they jump for joy and sing, where there's a long trip to Bethlehem and no room in the inn, where there's a babe that is wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger, and the angels and the shepherds, and Mary ponders all of these things in her heart. And then there is this version that we heard from the Gospel of Matthew this morning, where Joseph founds out that the woman he is engaged to is pregnant and the baby is not his. He proceeds to have an internal debate between the law and his heart, and to make decisions about what he should do. And he is exhausted enough that he falls asleep, and in a dream, an angel comes to him and tells him about the baby that Mary is carrying, and that he just has to believe, and that all will be well. 
This baby will be God with us, God in flesh on earth, and Joseph will raise him the best he knows how. And the next thing we hear is that the baby is born, and Joseph takes his role as father seriously, beginning with his responsibility of naming this baby, Jesus, the one who saves. There is clearly a reason why this version, the Matthew Gospel version of the story, is not the story we read on Christmas Eve. Comparatively, it's not as poetic or as detailed or as miraculous, perhaps, as that in Luke. But it doesn't make Jesus any less important or any less the savior that he is prophesied to be. It does, however, teach us something about Joseph that the other version simply does not. Now, from everything that I read about engagement back at that time, being betrothed to someone then in Joseph and Mary's time was as serious as being married with the only means of dissolution being divorce, not just returning the ring as we have the option to do nowadays. And so Joseph had a decision to make, follow the law and return Mary to her father's house and get to have her stoned to death as an adulteress, or save her and her reputation as best as he could by divorcing her quietly. And before Joseph hears the message from God, Before he is visited in his dreams by the angel, he makes the decision to be quiet about the whole thing, saving Mary's life in doing so. So the first thing that we learn about Joseph is that he is a man of mercy and of compassion. In the Hebrew tradition, the word for this is hesed, a sense of loving kindness that permeates all things. The other thing I think we can take away from this story is that Joseph is a man who is loyal and faithful. His love for God means that he is willing to take his dream, believe it as reality, and follow through. And I believe that we can also see Joseph as courageous. Not only was he doing something that might tarnish his reputation by keeping Mary around, but he was also preparing to raise a child that he had not planned with a woman he hadn't quite married yet. It takes courage to go against what society would say and have you do and follow a different path and a different course, no matter what it is that the decision is. It takes courage to answer a call from God, which is what this was for Joseph. Aside from carpentry, it was Joseph's calling to raise Jesus with all that entailed, all the unknowns, all the teaching of lessons and laws in his trade, all the ups and the downs, all the tough times and the blessings and all the love. So as I read this story again, and as we molded over in Bible study, three questions kept coming back to my mind. The first of which was, what if this is the only birth story of Jesus we ever had? Earlier, we mentioned that it doesn't change who Jesus was and is to us. Jesus is still the one who came to save and offer life abundant and eternal to share the example of love and faithfulness and justice, the one who was and is God with us. The second question was, what does this story teach us about Joseph? And that we've answered as well, that he was a man of faithfulness and loyalty, of mercy and compassion, of courage and deep love. And finally, I asked myself, well, what is it that we learn about who we should be and how we should live from this story today. Well, if we follow Joseph's example, then we too should be people of mercy and of love, of courage and faithfulness, of loyalty and a willingness to say yes and follow through when we hear a call from God to be about God's work in this world. With the knowledge that everyone has their own unique situations that they are facing and their own battles that they, that they are waging. We can follow Joseph's example and find the compassion to approach people perhaps a bit more gently and to share a bit more of God's love with them. With the knowledge that our world is facing some serious challenges, those of violence and war, of environmental issues, of refugee crises, of poverty and insufficiency for so many, perhaps we can follow Joseph's example and find the heart to do what is right and what is just, what is creative and sustaining, 
what can help bring new life into our world. After all, Jesus had to get the lessons of living from someone, and while inspired by God, of course, Mary and Joseph had to have something to do with that in real life and in real time. They had to teach their son. And so we can learn a lot from this couple and this man about how to live a life that is a blessing to God and to others, that is full of compassion and love, that is full of righteousness and justice, that is based on caring for God with us and what he would want us to be, and who he, who he would want us to be, and what he would want us to do. And so, my friends, with gratitude for these lessons that we learn from stories that are centuries old, and for the gift that is to come, I pray that we may try to lead our lives following this example, serving in word and deed with fierce courage, with gentle compassion, with loving kindness, and with deep faithfulness to our God who calls us even today and continues to offer us the most amazing gifts of all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you join me now in our preparation for prayer? enter now into our time of prayer. I have a few updates on our prayer joys and concerns. Um, we uh, received the good news that Ruth Allen, um, who had been in the hospital last weekend, was able to move to Bethel Healthcare this past Monday after her hip surgery. Um, also, our office manager, Janine McCullough, has recovered almost all the way from her bronchitis, and we were able to get our uh, Christmas Eve bulletins all um, run this week, so um, that was a good, uh, good news. But our um, sympathies go out to those of you who are coughing or still coughing, or um, especially um, our prayers are with any who have um, fragile immune systems that they can stay clear of these viruses this winter. Um, we continue to pray for Sunny Hoskins, Nina Jacobs, and Dan McKee as they recover from their knee surgeries. Um, also for Becky Bishop's parents, her mother Judy fell and broke a femur in Oklahoma. My sister-in-law broke her femur in California, um, and so both of them are in uh, recuperation, as is Walt Fisher's older sister Peg, who fell and broke her hip in Florida. And also uh, Wendy uh, Bradley's father-in-law, Gordon, um, broke his leg. So be careful on the ice, is all I'm saying. Everybody be very careful. Um, many are struggling with family difficulties or uncertainties, and often that is a little more painful at holiday times, those with addictions or mental illness or um, <coughs> struggles in their marriage. We, um, our hearts go out to you. Um, we uh, are praying for many who are undergoing medical testing or procedures with gratitude that yours uh, was okay. Uh, Janine has been on um, getting a little heart monitoring and testing, and so you, you pulled through two services today, and all you got to make it through is coffee hour, and we're good. Um, we also have many who are on our prayer list for reasons of um, being in cancer treatment. David Scribner asked for our prayers for his sister Leanne, who um, had been able to travel here for his father's funeral this summer, but um, she has had a recurrence of metastasized cancer and is quite ill, so our prayers are with David and with Leanne. And um, um, we have many joys, though, in our church life as well. Um, um, 
we, Jim Bayless was back in church at the 8.30 service and said that his daughter, Brooke, is expecting her fourth daughter soon and um, invites our prayers for her as she's had a few complications and her uh, youngest daughter, Summer, is has been in the hospital for asthma, so um, prayers are with them. Um, Victoria Scribner also, we got news from David that she has graduated with a degree in speech pathology from Towson University in Baltimore. So that's great news and uh, it's great to have uh, many of our young adults and college students back and to have the music of our choirs. I still have the music of your lessons and carols ringing in my ears from last week. So thank you and to the bell ringers as well. So I know you have many joys and concerns of your own to lift up. For whom shall we be in prayer? Yes. Patsy and Judy. Patsy and Judy. Diane. Diane. Yes. Oh, sorry. My brother-in-law David, who has a brain tumor. Oh, no. Um, so for um, Rissy's brother-in-law David, who has a brain tumor. Yes. Oh, her, her cousin Donna has been healed of pancreatic cancer. That is a very small percentage, so congratulations. Yes. For Lo baby Logan and Jimmy. Yes. He, he asked me to not pray for him in public. Pray for Tony. Pray for Tony in her marriage. I've already already prayed for, t for Steve's um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I did in private, but you can you can ask him about it if you if you're courageous. <laughs> yeah. um, I brought friends from Orlando and Cynthia who lost their baby. Oh, so Fernanda and Cynthia lost um, their four month old baby this week. That's so hard. Um, sorry, this side. Anybody? Yes. for um, Kelly's mother-in-law and father-in-law, Kathy and Mike. Yes. Oh, well, I'll, yes. For Danny and Matthew. Danny and Matthew. For uh, Rachel's sister, Jenny, who had heart surgery. Yes. For PJ's procedure with Parkinson's disease. Oh, for PJ's procedure with Parkinson's disease. Yes. For Tom's cousin Teddy, who's in uh, chemo. Hey. What? Hetty. Hetty. So sorry. Hetty Lamar. Lamar. Yes, having uh, chemo. Yes. Did you have your hand up? I'm sorry. I thought you jumped. Yes. Who did I miss? Maurice. For Mr. Dunphy. Donovan. Donovan. I pray for my hearing, people of faith. Okay. And for his sister Mary. Yes. Uh, for our friends, uh, Jessica and probably now we see lots of Justin this week is three years old. He was oh. in the hospital. Yeah, he was there today. For the loss of a police officer, Justin, and for his parents mm -hmm. yeah, in loss. And three year old little girl. Oh, it's so sad. Yes. For who? Chris and Lorraine. Oh my goodness. Uh, for Josh who had a torn Achilles tendon and had surgery on it. Yes. his master's is it in social work is it no data analysis sorry I've got the wrong degree you have that one okay so uh, yes so he asked for a prayer of Thanksgiving for his family for sticking by him as he finished said master's degree I hope you get some sleep in the near future as well well then let us um, unite our hearts in a time of prayer together Good and gracious God, you are our Lord of mercy, of infinite compassion. So we are 
infinitely grateful for the way your love breaks into our world, into our lives, in sometimes startling ways. We admit that sometimes we are unsettled by the power of your Holy Spirit moving among us in the midst of both our joy and in our sorrow, you show up. You are here with us in our brokenness, and we thank you for that. We thank you for lifting us up when we feel heavy with sorrow. We thank you for filling us with joy, the joy of new life, and the celebration and beauty of the season. We thank you for the way you guide our steps, you guide our decisions, you light our path, and you send us salvation in our Lord of love and peace in Jesus Christ. And so we pray that his love may indeed rule this world as we pray for our nation and our world leaders as they work and struggle and debate the way to move forward for justice and peace. We pray for all of those who around the world who struggle with rebuilding or recovering from natural disasters, those who lost their homes in storms this week, in flooding, those who um, work so hard during this season outdoors in the cold. We pray for all of those who live in places where there is violence or warfare, for families separated from their loved ones, whether they are refugees or migrants displaced from the Middle East or Central America, or for our servicemen and women stationed far from home. For all who serve, who uh, protect us from violence, those who work to end poverty and injustice everywhere, we give you thanks. We're so grateful that you continue to call us with all of our faults into discipleship. And we pray that you fill our hearts anew with your your loving kindness. Help us to be bringers, messengers from you into this world, bringing the good news of life to this, to our neighbors as we walk together in the way of Jesus Christ who taught us to pray his prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And we do um, have a stewardship moment from um, Jim, if you will share that with us. Good morning again. So this year our stewardship committee has expanded our focus, not only to pledging and counting and accounting, but to the many ways that people can practice their stewardship through their acts and the giving of their time and talent. And of course, Christmas is the time for generosity. And as we heard this morning, um, the story of Mary and Joseph, we realized that a family alone, on the move, not a strange place, but not a place where there was family, can have a lot of needs and be dependent on the on the charity of strangers in some ways for even something as basic as shelter and although they weren't refugees they would soon become refugees as they traveled into exile in Egypt so that story rings with us and comes back to us at this time of year but I want to also bring to your thoughts and challenge you a bit with another set of thoughts about strangers in our lives, about people who may be estranged, people who might be on the fringes of mainstream society for a lot of different reasons, whether it's poverty or whether it's mental illness or whatever it might be, but also even more directly, people in your own circle, 
family that you may be estranged from, friends who over a period of time may have grown distant or there might have been words or acts that drove them apart and drove a wedge between them and the people that love them or have loved them. The acts that sometimes can build a wall so high and so strong that it seems like it can't ever be scaled. And so now might be the time, this year might be the year, to hold out a hand of reconciliation, to have a note, a card, a word of forgiveness to those people, to take that risk, that not insignificant risk of rejection or disappointment, but to try again to, to reconcile with people in your life or outside of your life which have become estranged. So it's Christmas. It's time for giving. And in the spirit of Christian love, this morning's offering will be received.
Will you join with me now in our offertory prayer? Loving Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to respond to your abundant grace and endless generosity by sharing a portion of what we have been given with others. Our hearts are filled with love as we reach out to share faithfully in your name. As we prepare to receive Christ's light once again, we pray that you would bless these gifts and inspire our ministries through them, that we may find ways to offer fresh hope to the world. Amen. friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with loving kindness and grant you peace. And may God watch between and among us until we meet again. Amen. And now blessed by the peace of Christ, let us share a sign of that peace with one another and especially bring those signs of peace out into the world. The peace of Christ be with you all. Amen.